So here we are in Mark uh, 6, verse 45. This is the Mark series, part 22, dealing with theology and apologetics. We're going to do both of those topics heavy today in the theology. That's what I'm most excited about. But there's also some apologetics-related content we're going to start with in Mark, some supposed geographical problems in the Gospel of Mark, and I'll offer some resolutions to those. Um, this is the passage about Jesus walking on the water and the main thing I want you to pick up on is that this, like so many of the other passages in the Gospel of Mark, that Jesus does something, he heals somebody, he forgives somebody, he casts out a demon. The purpose of these passages is to tell us who Jesus is. And that is very strong in the Gospel of Mark, that the identity of Christ is being communicated by the activity of Christ. And so um, I'll show you why I'm, ex you'll see why I'm excited about this. Because we keep seeing it over and over again. You grab any one of these stories by itself and you are pushed to see Christ for who he is, right? He is God with us. And that's a big deal, especially because modern, <clears throat> um, not even just modern, but so also some of the older scholars would like to say, only some of the scholars, obviously the non-Christian ones generally want to say this, that uh, in the Gospel of Mark, you have a low Christology that Mark has a low view of who Jesus is, and that by the time you get to John, you have a high Christology. And this is just not true. There's a different way of communicating in Mark than in John. And when we look at Mark and how he's communicating who Christ is, we see his high Christology. So here we are, Mark 6. I'm going to read the whole passage. We want to get it all into our minds. This is our Bible study. <clears throat> so starting in verse 45, all the way through verse 56. So we're going to finally finish Mark chapter 6 today. Move on to Mark, ch Mark chapter 7. This has been the marathon chapter for us. So, uh, Mark 6, 45, immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he himself was sending the crowd away. After bidding them farewell, he left for the mountain to pray. When it was evening, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land. Seeing them straining at the oars, for the wind was against them, at about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea, and he intended to pass by them. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed that it was a ghost and cried out. For they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke with them and said to them, Take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. Then he got into the boat with them, and the wind stopped, and they were utterly astonished. For they had not gained any insight from the incident of the loaves, but their heart was hardened. When they had crossed over, they came to, the land, to land at Gennesaret and moored to the shore. When they got out of the boat, immediately the people recognized him and ran about that whole country and began to carry here and there on their pallets those who were sick to the place they heard he was. Wherever he entered villages or cities or countryside, they were laying the sick in the marketplaces and imploring him that they might just touch the fringe of his cloak. And as many as touched it were being cured. So we have here uh, this scene. It, it's <clears throat> following the, the feeding of the 5,000. And after the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus like separates the disciples from the crowd. Then he separates himself from the crowd. They're on their way across the sea. The wind's against them. Jesus comes to them walking on the water. Then they do a whole other series of healings in the land of Gennesaret where they end up landing. We're going to dig into the theology of this and how, I don't know if you noticed it, maybe you didn't. Did you notice the deity of Christ in there anywhere? Um, well, you're going to see it because it's going to be in the connection of what Jesus does along with the Old Testament, which is, of course, the interpretive grid for who Jesus is throughout the Gospel of Mark, well, throughout the entire New Testament. Mark 6, 45. Let's look at it now verse by verse. <clears throat> Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he himself was sending the crowd away. Now, I'm going to front load all the apologetic stuff, okay? We're going to do it right now, and then we'll get into the theology after that. In Mark 6.45, it says that they left from the feeding of the 5,000 to go to Bethsaida. And it's not just to Bethsaida, it's to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, right? To Bethsaida. Now, there's a few problems with this, three problems that people will bring up, challenges they'll bring to the Gospel of Mark. One of them is that this seems to have the disciples going from Bethsaida to Bethsaida. They're like going from this, this place to this place, which doesn't really make a whole lot of sense, right? Unless Bethsaida is really big. There's something going on here that could be a little confusing. In Luke um, and in Mark, we have 
that some people will say there's a conflict here because Luke has the healing, I'm sorry, the, the miracle of the 5,000, the, the feeding of the 5,000 happening at Bethsaida. Mark has them leaving from the miracle to Bethsaida. So they say this is a conflict. Now, when you look at these passages more carefully, you'll see that all of the gospels agree on the healing of the 5,000. It was not in a city at all. It was in a desolate place. And the desolate place was near Bethsaida. So what we have is a place near Bethsaida, but not in Bethsaida. And that's where they're located. That's like the first part of the puzzle. And um, I just want to say here, Mark isn't dumb. Mark shows them being near Bethsaida. As you read through the whole Gospel of Mark, you'll see they're near Bethsaida at the feeding of the 5,000. And Mark's not like a dummy. Like he doesn't know where they are. And so when he says... They're going to Bethsaida, and some want to have a snarky rebuttal to the Bible. Oh, it's contradicting itself right there. Sometimes you need to give an author the benefit of the doubt. And you need to say, because this would be such an obvious problem, they probably didn't mean it that way. And just kind of give them some slight benefit of the doubt. It almost reminds me of the, of the cruel thing that teachers do to students every once in a while, usually once a year in a certain, certain period of uh, their schooling, where they tell all their kids, Write down instructions on how to build a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, right? And the kid writes instructions down, they give it, and they give, give as detailed and exact as possible. And then the teacher will proceed to brutally read it in the worst fashion of, you know, the worst possible way. So if it says, get the bread and put the peanut butter on the bread, they will just grab a loaf of bread. They won't open it. They'll just grab a, bottle, a whole jar of peanut butter and drop it on the loaf of bread because they're going to read it in the most wooden way, which was obviously not intended by the author. That's what scholars sometimes do to the Bible. They read in the most wooden way possible, and it creates the problems. And the whole time, the student's like, well, obviously, I didn't mean that. And sometimes I, I think, you know, sometimes the authors of the Bible, if they could, they would walk into these scholars debating things and be like, well, obviously, that's not what I meant, you know. <clears throat> so, yes. Um, so they're not going from, from Bethsaida to Bethsaida. In that sense, um, they're near Bethsaida, not in the city of Bethsaida. But there's more to it than this. There's a couple other problems we'll bring up, but one solution is going to really help solve all of these problems. And that is in understanding that when Mark says they were going to cross over to Bethsaida, and Mark has them in a field, in a grassy, remember that he was in a grassy place? They were in a grassy field near Bethsaida. Mark seems to actually be saying, and this is what I think is happening here, is my best guess at it, he's actually saying they're going to cross past Bethsaida. They're going to cross the Sea of Galilee in the direction of Bethsaida. So you have the Sea of Galilee, it, it looks kind of like this, like kind of like a light bulb sort of shape, the Sea of Galilee. And, and all, most of the activity of Jesus is happening in this region of the Sea of Galilee right here in the, on the northern and the north, northeast and northwest sides. Well, on the northeast side, you have Bethsaida up here. Then you have a field, the grassy field of Bethsaida, probably right around here, right? And then they're going to cross the Sea of Galilee in front of or near Bethsaida, as opposed to crossing down this way, down the sea. They're going to cross that way. That seems to be what Mark is saying. Um, <clears throat> according to uh, BDAG, which is the name of a Greek lexicon, this is like a standard Greek lexicon typically used, that word to Bethsaida is the Greek word pros. And BDAG says about it, it can mean to or towards Right? Or towards, these are a couple of different various, various meaning, meanings, or near. It especially means to or towards if it's after a verb. So I want you to go, pros, Bethsaida. It could mean to or towards. Jesus could be commanding them to go towards Bethsaida, across the sea. Now, if they're already near Bethsaida, it would then be indicating what direction they're going to cross the sea from. In John uh, 6, verse 17, we have... Um, Another issue, which is that in John 6, 17, John says that they're crossing in the same event, they're crossing towards or to Capernaum, not to Bethsaida, but to Capernaum. Well, if you take Mark to mean towards Bethsaida or near Bethsaida, they could easily pass Bethsaida. You see, from your angle, it would actually go in this way, and they land in the area of Capernaum. So then the two would harmonize perfectly fine, and it's a normal use of the word pros to do that. It's an acceptable term. But why else would you think that... Mark means to or toward, or it means toward, not to. Don't go directly to Bethsaida, but go in that direction of Bethsaida. Well, in Mark 11.4 and in Mark 4.1 and in Mark 3.7, he uses pros in other ways than to, 
He uses it to mean near or before or toward in all three of those verses. Also, when you look at the passage of Mark that I just read to you, there's a hint maybe in the passage that he's not asking them to go directly to Bethsaida. So Mark 6.45, he tells them, um, go ahead of him, to go ahead of him to the other side to Bethsaida. Then in Mark 6.53, at the end of the journey, it says when they'd crossed over, so there's some successful crossing over they did there, they came to land at Gennesaret. And Gennesaret is not near Bethsaida. So they're landing at Gennesaret. Now, some people think the wind and the storm, that, the windstorm that was going on, there doesn't seem to be rain, but it's some kind of windstorm, that that re, you know, redirected them, that they ended up landing where they didn't want to land, and that's what's happening in the Gospel of Mark. But Mark doesn't say that, does it? It doesn't say the wind changed their destination. It says it slowed them on their travel. So there's nothing in Mark to tell us that they failed to get where they were going. So they cross over to Gennesaret, or from your, your direction, the map will be right here. They cross over to Gennesaret, across Bethsaida, passing Bethsaida. That seems to make sense. And Bethsaida and Capernaum, um, or excuse me, Capernaum and Gennesaret are actually overlapping areas. And so John and Mark, they end up harmonizing well. <clears throat> so um, there's a link in the description of this video, not for you guys who are here live. <laughs> You can't click anything right now. Uh, but in the description of this video, there's a link to an actual video where I did, I dealt with supposed Bible contradictions. And I'll put you to right to the timestamp where I actually put maps up and I deal with this very issue in these passages in a lot more detail. I just wanted to cover it because we're in the Gospel of Mark right now. Um, now, some people offer some other supposed like ways. And these are alternate explanations for how we can harmonize these different passages in Mark and John. And some say that Bethsaida may have been a stop on the way to the Capernaum. So they may have had multiple stops. They went to Bethsaida, then they went to Capernaum area, and so which, which is near Gennesaret. They overlap each other somewhat because they're not as specific and detailed as we are. You look at a map today and you're like, no, no, Orange. if you cross the street, you're in Orange County, not LA County anymore. And we nitpick over those details, but they didn't worry about those kinds of little differences so much. Um, now, this would be um, a couple of the guys who say this. D.A. Carson and Craig Blomberg try to make a case for this, suggest that they were, yeah, it was just a journey with multiple stops. John focuses on Capernaum. Mark talks about Bethsaida. That's a possibility. Um, I don't know if that's the case or not. Others suggest that there were actually two Bethsaidas, and biblical scholar John Gill made a case for this. Uh, Bethsaida, the term Bethsaida just means house of fish. And so it may have just been a fishing village. And so he's like, oh, there may have been multiples that were there. Um, and I don't know if that's the case. I'm content just saying pros means toward. And the whole problem goes away with just that, that one suggestion right there. So there you go. That's the, um, <clears throat> that's the apologetic side. Oh, there's one more issue, which is them crossing over I'll get into. But I'll mention I have three articles in the video description as well by Steve Hayes, Lydia McGrew, and Jonathan McClatchy, all three who tackle this issue and give you way more details than I think if I tried to even give them to you at all it wouldn't fit the study tonight, so it's just TMI. So I'll give you the summary. Um, a third issue is this, is that oftentimes in Mark, he talks about them crossing over, crossing over, there's multiple journeys in the Gospel of Mark where they cross over the Sea of Galilee. And when we see the Sea of Galilee, we kind of picture in our heads like that light bulb shape, and we wanna cut it down the middle so that east and west, and crossing over means going from the, 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 the west to the east or the other way around. But that probably wasn't what was happening in the mind of the fishermen in the first century. They didn't have a map, for instance. The guy would live on the Sea of Galilee his whole life and never see a map of the place. Can you imagine never seeing a map? I'm old enough to remember the first time I saw a map of my local area, and I was like, oh, that's where everything is. And I realized that my mental map was different than the actual physical map. Right, because your mental map, you're, you're like, okay, well, my house is over here, and then there's like the store I usually go to, there's my school I attend, there's my buddy's house, my other buddy's house, and you kind of highlight certain areas and the streets you tend to travel on, and you think of your city as being the areas you visit the most, and then the parts of your city you never go to are almost like, I don't know, the other side of the city, because it's the other side from your perspective. Well, the fishermen would have been in the northern and especially northwestern area of the Sea of Galilee. When they crossed over, they were probably crossing over to the place they generally wouldn't go to. And that's all it's saying. It's not saying they went from east to west. It's saying they went from home turf to not home turf. 
their side of the tracks to the wrong side of the tracks is kind of the kind of the idea. Uh, Richard Baca makes a case for this. Um, in a video, which I will also link in the video description here, about the fisherman's world. He did a bunch of work on the Galilean fishermen and this kind of stuff, and he's real interesting. And he's got a British accent, so it's fun to listen to. <clears throat> he originally thought there were errors in the Gospel of Mark on geography, but his when he turned his scholarly research to the topic, he changed his mind. And he thought that the evidence bore out that Mark had great geography, and that it actually showed that it had an actual Capernaum fisherman behind it as the eyewitness source for all this information. All that to say, they use the term crossover to refer to going from their normal region to the region where they aren't normally hanging out. That's pretty much it. You could kind of think of them as crossing over the Jordan River, almost that's the, the tipping point. When they cross over to the Jordan River, and that even ties into the Old Testament, when they cross over. It's always the Jordan River they're crossing over, a lot of times in the Old Testament. What is this? This idea of crossing over, this idea of pros meaning toward, this has what's called explanatory power. It means that it, it solves several different riddles all at once, and it's in a sensical fashion. And um, there you go. <clears throat> okay, the next thing that happens in Mark 6.45, it says that Jesus made his disciples get into the boat. And what happens here is interesting, because it's like a forceful thing. He like made them get into the boat. And I just was like wondering why. Why, did he have to, why didn't he just tell them to get in the boat? Why did he have to make them get in the boat? Well, according to John, the, after the feeding of the 5,000, the crowd wanted to like rally around Jesus and start a rebellion against Rome. They wanted to make him king. I wonder if the disciples got caught up in some of this too. Remember, Simon the Zealot is one of the guys there. And they don't yet understand the mission of Jesus that well. They're trying to. They try to mimic Jesus, but do they really get his mission? You know, And so it may be that the disciples, like the crowd, wanted to push Jesus in the wrong direction, not the direction of his ministry that he was actually performing. And I think we can learn a lesson here because sometimes we get zealous for the wrong things and we get all excited about maybe our political agendas, what we think is the most important thing of the day. And we forget the call to be a disciple and to make disciples that we're in this world, not of it. And that's like the main thing that we need to focus on in our lives. Not that those other things don't matter, but that this is the primary thing. Just, it's, it's on tier number one. Tier number one. In verse 46, <clears throat> it says, after bidding them farewell, he left for the mountain to pray. Uh, bidding them farewell is probably the crowds. Probably the crowds. Um, this would have been kind of difficult because again, they wanted to make him king. And that would have potentially caused a problem, but he sends the disciples away. And I, I feel like he's just confusing people about where he's even going at this point. This might be a hint at why he told them cross toward Bethsaida because he's not giving them an exact destination for them all to hear. Because remember, the crowd followed him last time. They followed him across the lake last time. So maybe now he's trying to find a way to get away from the crowd. And this seems kind of strange. Who does this in ministry? You have this massive following and you purposely ditch them. Like, who does this? this? Think about this. Like, in church growth seminars, when do they ever talk about purposely shrinking your fellowship? Is it, I don't think it happens, but Jesus seems like he does it again and again. And I think we need to learn from this, and I don't want to blow it out of proportion, but there's something to learn. In John 6... Jesus does this big time. It's probably the best example of it where he teaches them, you know, you know, eat, eat, eat my blood and, and or eat my body, drink my blood. And now he says later, much later, he goes, I'm, my words are spirit. I'm speaking spiritually and da, da, da. But at the same time, they're like, this is a difficult teaching, Jesus. And he's just like, effectively, let me paraphrase, super bad paraphrase for me. I'll admit it, but suck it up is kind of what he says to them. Effectively, here's my really rough teaching. And in John 6, verse 66, after all this, it says, as a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. And when you read John 6, it looks like it's on purpose. I think Jesus intentionally shrunk the ministry because he just didn't want, he didn't just want people following him. He needed to confront them with the gospel, even if that meant shrinking his following. And I think that's a good example for us. <clears throat> in Luke 14, 25, it says, now large crowds were going along with him. So that's the, the preface, right? Large crowds. He's got a bunch of people with him. And he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Who does not carry, he, whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. 
I think the lesson is this. Jesus was not into numbers. He was on mission. He was on mission. But I'm telling you, every pastor's event that I've been to, somebody comes up to me and they say, where's your church? Oh, did I do Bellflower, California? Oh, uh, how many people? Every single one, right? Mike knows. <laughs> it's the same every time. And I, I've always like avoided answering the question because I don't care how many people, I don't, I don't validate the, the ministry by how many people are attending. It's great because it means you can reach that many people. You can hopefully bless them. But here's Jesus purposely shrinking. We, we change our, our focus from ministry to numbers sometimes. <clears throat> and here's an important question to avoid this modern mistake and follow Jesus. Is the crowd shaping me into their image or am I shaping them into the image of Christ? That's a great message, a question I should say to ask about any ministry. I have all these people coming, but wait, am I shaping them into the image of Christ or are they shaping me into their image? Where it's now become sort of the tail wags the dog. You know, the, the ministry is, is effectively a people magnet. That's what we are. Everything we do is just to draw people. Now, I don't want to go overboard with this, and I don't want to like criticize a youth ministry for ordering pizza for their kids. I don't know what it is with people criticizing youth ministries for eating pizza. It just seems like the dumbest criticism I've ever heard. <laughs> um, I don't, and neither do I want to say that a ministry is bad because they have a great worship band. Like, what, what? What's wrong with that? Like, that's even biblical. Like, right? Like, David's writing this great music. Do you think like the Holy Spirit was like David? I need you to write really cruddy music. If you're really going to honor me, it's got to be bad. You know, like, I don't think that was the case. But there's another separate issue that's more like right to the core of it, which is just that, are we really driving to make disciples who follow Christ? Or do we get people here and leave them short of discipleship somehow? Do we compromise that because we don't want to offend the crowd? When the issue of homosexuality in our culture comes up and people come and they're like to Jesus in John 6, like, Jesus, you talk, keep talking about this. People are going to leave. You know, are we able to say, that's why I have to keep talking about it. That's why I have to talk and speak the truth on this issue is because it's a stumbling block to them following Jesus in our culture. Um, so, yeah. Because <clears throat> numbers sometimes actually conflicts with our mission. It actually conflicts with our mission. And for this, we need to sort of reformat the way we look at churches. Some people, they want to say a church is successful if it has a lot of numbers. Of course, others want to say the church is evil if it has a lot of numbers. I don't think either of those is true. Numbers are secondary. That's the whole point. The whole point is the numbers are second. It's a secondary issue. Primary issue is discipleship, honoring Christ, um, doing that. But there is currently a modern decrease in church attendance. And we read articles about it. In, in the U.S., especially in the U.S., a decrease in church attendance. It's like later generations, younger generations are simply not going to church. They're not interested in church. And most of these articles blame the church, right? It's all the church's fault. Here's what the church is doing wrong. Here's what they're doing wrong. And I want to say there's probably some truth in those things. There's some elements of reality amongst those things. That the church is failing here or there. But at the same time, I can't help but notice our culture is getting wicked and dark and rebellious against God. And I'm like, duh, they're not going to church. They're rebelling against God. Of course, they don't want to go to church. I think the lack of church attendance is more a reflection of culture than it is the church. I'm not trying to get people off the hook here, but I do think that that's the case. I don't think there's all these people that just love Jesus and they just hate church. I'm like, I don't think it works that way. <laughs> I think you love Jesus, you tend to love church. Now, granted, if you're at a church and you think to yourself, boy, that was I wouldn't, they don't teach the word, we're not really focused on Christ, all these types of things are going on. I fully am with you, that's a real problem. And, and may God use you to help change the environment somehow. And you know, we don't want to abandon, though, the fellowship and, and gathering together, that sort of thing. But there's just something to be said for the fact that sometimes the diminishment of numbers is a commentary on the numbers, not on the, not on the church. And just try to be balanced about it. Okay, so um, he left for the mountain to pray. He left for the mountain to pray, it says in verse 46. So Jesus, after he, he ditches the crowd, ditches the disciples or gets them to leave, he goes to the mountain to pray. And apparently he's praying for hours because it's a long time before he actually meets the disciples. They, they're rowing for hours, trying to get across the sea, fighting the wind. And I just want to mention on, on, on this, there's a necessity of a private prayer life. And I think that perhaps our private prayer life has never been under greater threat than it is right now today. 
And it's primarily because of this thing right here. I mean, every waking moment of my life can easily be consumed with something, even positive things. Look, I've already, I got notifications. Look, I think Justin Kinsel texted me. Cool. I got to talk to him, right? You know, I've got, a, I've got always a reason. There's always something. There's podcasts I want to listen to. There's videos I want to watch, even educational stuff or entertainment or I want to check notifications. But we, and, and these things aren't necessarily evil. It's just that we don't want them to rob us of our prayer life, you know? Have a private prayer life. And I don't know how many hours it's going to be. And I don't want to beat you up over it. I just want to say have a private prayer life. Like prioritize that in your own heart, in your own life. <clears throat> There's a necessity of a private prayer life. There's also a corporate prayer life that's also necessary and important. When Jesus actually taught us to pray, he taught us the our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. That, that prayer is all plural. It's got eight plural pronouns throughout that prayer. It's meant to be something we pray together. And we can, you can pray individually, but you also can pray it as a group. So don't fail to pray in groups, but also don't fail to be alone. In Matthew 6, Jesus talks about this, Matthew 6, 5. When you pray, you are not, like, not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. Notice the problem is not that they're praying in, in public in groups. It's that they're putting prayer on display for the godly appearance of prayer. That's different. He says, truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you pray, go into your inner room Close your door and pray to your father who's in secret and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So the question is, are you neglecting this command of Jesus? If so, please stop beating yourself up and just start praying more. <laughs> you know, Just set aside some time tonight to just be alone. You know, Today, why not just, if you're watching the video, pause it for 10 minutes and just pray. And just create some space for private prayer. It's super important in our lives. It's really needful. We need it for ourselves and also because prayer actually does change things. Um, <clears throat> so do that. Do that. Make time. If Jesus could, you could. I mean, did he not have pressing priorities? Didn't he have important things to do? I mean, certainly everything he did was more important than anything I've ever done. But yet he made time to pray for hours. He could have been teaching that crowd, but instead he sends them off. And he, it was time to pray. Sometimes it's just time to pray. And sometimes it's time to sleep, too. That's a different Bible study. <clears throat> yeah. So do both, private prayer and public prayer. I'm going to suggest that if you do one of these without the other, it will create a problem with you spiritually. It will not be healthy for you, is what I'm saying. Private prayer and public prayer. These are both positive, healthy things. Verse 47 says, When it was evening, the boat was in the, midst, in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land. <clears throat> seeing them straining at the oars, for the wind was against them, at about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea, and he intended to pass by them. <coughs> Pardon me. The fourth watch of the night would be about 3 to 6 a.m. This was like the Roman calendar that they had. So it was between 3 and 6 a.m. It, it might have been just cracking dawn a little bit, or it, or it may not have been somewhere in that, in that, in that uh, space. And here we get to the, the concept of Jesus walking on the water. And this gets interesting. There was a trend years ago with scholars uh, where they wanted to demythologize scripture. That's the phrase they would use. We're going to demythologize scripture, which effectively results in this. Assuming every miracle story is fake and not a miracle, and that everything that did happen happened through natural causes. Let me read to you uh, from James Edwards, his commentary on the Gospel of Mark. He says it about this passage, Mark 6. He says, Mark 6, 45 through 52, was the object of intense interest in post-enlightenment lives of Jesus. Starting from the premise that the laws of nature are inviolable and that all things in the universe must be capable of rationalistic explanation, the most improbable and far-fetched theories were advanced to explain Jesus walking on the Sea of Galilee. Albert Schweitzer's The Quest of the Historical Jesus in 1906 documents the opinions of scores of scholars who judge this story an optical illusion created by Jesus walking along the shore or a deception caused by his walking on a sandbar. For solely rationalist interpreters, the story was a code to be cracked, a conundrum to be resolved. Now, I'll, I'll spare you this. In, but I'll say in, in the Greek, like, there's no way around it. Like, he's walking on the water. Like, it's clearly proclaiming he was walking on the water. That's the statement. But they know there's a historical something that caused all this to be written, so they would come up with all these explanations. 
I heard one time uh, on, I believe it was the History Channel, they were interviewing some very self-assured scholar who was talking about his theory about what really happened when Jesus was walking on the water. And his theory was that it was a mirage. That, you know, they're, they're in Palestine, it's, it's desert land, and it was a mirage. Let's just think about this for a second, shall we? This guy's gotten, is interviewed on a major network, and he's presented as a scholar who's, who's building an alternate case. First off, I'll say this. The Sea of Galilee, and I've been there twice, it doesn't have mirages because it's not a desert. It's not deserty at all. It, the Sea of Galilee is a very nice area. We, we, we stayed in a kibbutz on the Sea of Galilee. It was beautiful. It was wonderful. We went swimming in the water. There's no, no desert there. But let me just say this. Even if it was the desert, even if it was the middle of the desert, how do you have a mirage at 4 o'clock in the morning? It's nighttime. There's no heat, which creates the mirage, and there's no sunlight, which creates the mirage. Like, it's not going to happen. Third, what kind of an idiot do you have to be to think that Jesus is walking on the water when it's a mirage? And they didn't discover this later? I'm sorry, but... <laughs> These guys are experienced fishermen. They've been fishing their whole lives. They've been fishing in that spot their whole lives. Here's Jesus coming to them. In fact, they're in the middle of the water trying to make their way across the water. It doesn't make any sense at all. It's totally far-fetched. But do you know why it's believable to some people? Because it's not a miracle. Because anything miraculous is automatically unbelievable and any alternate explanation, no matter how crazy it is, is accepted. Because it's a bias against the supernatural. <clears throat> because they say the laws of nature are inviolable. They, you know, God can't sort of supersede the laws of nature. Well, I don't think that God breaks the laws of nature. I just think he can mess with stuff anytime he wants. You know, when I, I you know, create a fish tank and I fill it with fish and I put all the stuff there and I balance the pH and all these fun things, and then I go and I add food. I mean, if the fish were scientists, they might look at this and think, to, think food's appearing out of nowhere. You know, they just don't understand. Like, I'm entering... Um, you know, there's this other being entering their sort of realm and messing with stuff for their benefit in this case. And that's just how it is. It's not, it's, not a, it's not a violation, so to speak. It's just God has the power to do those things. So I would say this. The laws of nature are actually, rather than violating miracles or saying miracles can't happen, the laws of nature create what's called the necessary preconditions for miracles. You see, if nature didn't have a standard way of acting then you wouldn't notice when God did something. Like if you were walking down the street and suddenly SpongeBob SquarePants popped into existence, laughed at you, and then blew up, and that sort of thing happened all the time, you would never know if God did something. Because you would just think, reality's weird, man. There's weird stuff happens. How would you know God did anything? You need a normal order of events, of things, of, of sort of physics, to notice when God's acting. Uh, some people like to come against this walking on the water thing and they say, well, the Bible teaches that people can walk on water. But actually, the Bible's doing the opposite. It's saying that because people can't walk on water, what Jesus is doing is pretty significant. That's the whole point, is this doesn't normally happen. The Bible counts on a natural natural physics, a natural way, laws of the universe kind of thing. And um, really, a lot of scientists have based their, their search through physics and through discovering natural laws on a Christian worldview because that, that worldview does sustain that. As opposed to, say, worldviews where they think the moon is actually some sort of weird god, right? Then you don't have, like, this sort of natural law. You, you think that the sun is a god that has to fight through the underworld to get back up each day in the morning. And so you don't have natural laws. You've got weird, uh, like a supernatural view of what's actually natural. The Bible doesn't do that. Um, some people, ironically, will say, <clears throat> that God has to prove himself with a miracle. And then they will follow up any evidence for a miracle with the phrase that miracles should never be believed, no matter how much evidence you have. Have you encountered this before? And I would want these people just, if they're listening, is to think about this. <clears throat> God has to prove himself with a miracle, yet miracles should never be believed. You can't rationally hold both of those. It's not rational. You know, and, <clears throat> and there is, now I don't have a whole lot of extra biblical evidence for Jesus walking on the water, nor do I think I need to. I don't think I have to prove everything in the Bible extra biblically. I think we can prove the Bible is God's word and then we should trust it. But 
What's interesting is this. There is one miracle of Jesus that has more extra biblical evidence than anything else he ever did. And it's the most amazing miracle of Jesus. It's the resurrection of Christ. And so here we have God having preserved all this evidence for this central miracle of Christ, where if the resurrection happened, well, then that makes the walking on water quite believable. Do you see the connection there? So you could bring someone in a, through a path of evidence, if they're open to the evidence, to the place of even believing Jesus walked on water. Uh, it validates the rest. <clears throat> okay, something else to notice about Jesus walking on the water. Uh, Jesus sent them into this trial, and he, like he did in Mark chapter 4. They go out into the water, and they're, they go into a storm. Normally, the fishermen are not going to travel in the evenings on the Sea of Galilee. They just don't bother because it's kind of dangerous. But here Jesus sends them purposefully into trials. And this is, I wonder what they were thinking as fishermen, because they're probably thinking, you know, Jesus, we really shouldn't be traveling the Sea of Galilee right now. There's a storm coming or the wind's picking up, but they're just going to be obedient and go. <clears throat> and I think there's a lesson for us in this. And that's that God might send you into a trial on purpose. Sorry. I don't like it either. <laughs> Any more than you. But I'm comforted if I just know that it's God's plan. There's something comforting about this. I mean, encouraging in my life if I can look at some horrible trial I'm in and I go, Lord, at least this is part of your plan. That means there's an agenda for it. it means there's a purpose for it. And I'm comforted. I'm encouraged by that. But what were they learning? What were they learning in this trial? Here's a trial. What was the fruit that came out of it? And I, I think that sometimes in the cases for us too, that all you're learning in a trial is to trust God in trials. I mean, sometimes that's the whole lesson of a trial. You're just learning to trust him in the middle of a trial. Now, they hadn't learned it yet. They're still fearful. They're still not expecting God to, to do anything. They're still having all these issues. But eventually, they would learn it. This same guy that was in the boat, who was terrified, in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12, Peter says this, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. He's like, you know, when you go through, like, how is this happening to me? How, I, why on earth am I going through such a trial? And Peter's like, hey man, I've been there. Don't think this is weird. This is something that's come upon you to purify you, to change you, to transform you. But it seems so weird. Why this? Why this? You're learning to trust. We get greater maturity um, and we learn to see our trials, our current trials, not our... See, it's one thing to see your past trials as something God used. You guys, are you guys with me on that? Like, you, I look at my past trials. Ten years ago, I'm like, man, I totally see how God used that. Boy, I was totally like, what's going on? I'm like the disciples in the boat. We're going to die. But now I look back and I see how God used it for my growth and maturity. Real Christian maturity is seeing today's trials as something that God is using. That's great growth in Christ. And it's very healthy for you. First Peter uh, chapter 1, verses 6 and 7 says this. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being much, uh, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. James supports it more with this, James 1 verses 2 and 4, 2 through 4. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter Various trials. There couldn't be a more generic way to say it. Various trials. What is it? Toothache, demonic attack, and everything in between. Like, it's just various trials. Consider it joy. He doesn't say enjoy it, okay? He says consider it joy. This is a very carefully worded way of putting it. Consider it joy. Why? <laughs> Knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect results so that you may be perfect and complete and lacking in nothing. What am I learning in my trial? It may not be an educational lesson like you're learning information. It's character lessons. I'm learning endurance. I'm learning to trust God and wait on God, wait on God, wait on God, wait on God, and I'm learning how to do that. It turns out that God seems more committed to my character than he is to my comfort. And um, eternally, I will thank him for it. And in the moment, I will trust him in it, you know? But it's not just your character, because if you're learning to trust in God, then what you're doing is you're experiencing something relational between you and God. When you learn to trust God more, you're building that love relationship between you and God. And this is the highest 
thing in your entire existence is your relationship with God, your walk with God. God cares about your relationship with him and trials cause you to lean and grow with him. Just like when you go through hard stuff as a, as a married couple or as a family, it brings you together. There's something that it does this in our walk with God as well. Okay, well, in uh, this passage, Jesus is walking on the water and he's going to walk past them. In fact, it says he intended to pass them by. That's the phrasing that's used in, in uh, the NASB here. Um, now, perhaps this was not to miss them, not like he, he was intending to just miss them entirely. That, that's how it comes off as you read it, I think, to some of us. But it may be that he was intending to pass near them. Like he was intending to, because he could have just walked to wherever they were going to end up, but he was trying to pass near them. He intended to get close to them. Um, it was it, earlier in the same passage, it says, seeing them straining at the oars, he came to them. So Mark indicating that he meant to get close to them, that the goal was to be near them. So I just don't want you to think like he's like, doo, 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 I'm going to ignore you guys. I'm out of here. And they're like, whoa, dude, who is that? And no, no, this isn't, it just makes it weird instead of what it probably was. So at any rate, uh, Jesus wanted them to see him. The emphasis here is going to be Jesus, this guy can walk on water, right? But there's more in a moment on why he passed by them and it connects to the Old Testament and I'll come back to that in a second. So keep it in mind. Verse 49, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed that it was a ghost and cried out for they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke with them and said to them, take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. So they thought he was a ghost. This happens kind of again at the resurrection. When Christ rises from the dead, they think he's a ghost. I think this is our tendency um, to take supernatural things and turn them into spooky, ooky things. You know, and sometimes come up with weird explanations for what God is doing. So, like, you know, okay, wow, I read Jesus. I'm a Buddhist, but I read Jesus, and it was just really interesting. And I think, I think maybe Jesus is a reincarnation of the Buddha. And you're just like, but there's no reason to think that. Like, this isn't what you would get out if you're just paying attention to what we're reading you know, and what the history of it says. Sometimes we just come up with weird stuff, you know, and um, that's kind of what they're doing here. But it shows them that, it shows that what they're seeing is something they can't, it's like beyond their thinking and they just go, oh, maybe it's a ghost, maybe it's a ghost. By the way, ghost here doesn't mean some resurrected physical thing. It's like maybe it's a phantasm. We don't know what we're looking at. Jesus' words to them though are, take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. This is just encouraging to my heart. Here you are going through difficult times, and I do think I think this applies. I don't think I'm twisting the scripture to apply this to this. You go through hard times, and you think for a minute, wait a minute, I can take courage because God is with me. It is I. Don't be afraid. It's me. I'm with you. Don't be afraid. Just the and and this is not the feeling that God is with you. They weren't feeling anything at the time. This is the knowledge that God is with you, and that's that transcends my feelings. And I think I appreciate that a lot more, to be honest. Hebrews 13.5 says, Make sure that your character is free from the love of money. Be content with what you have, for he himself has said, and here's the promise, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. And God's with me. Just take peace and comfort in that, even in the midst of whatever's going on. Verse 51, Then he got into the boat with them, and the wind stopped, and they were utterly astonished, for they had not gained any insight from the incident of the loaves, but their heart was hardened. <clears throat> Check this out in the Gospel of Mark. What, what have I been hammering on? The things Jesus does are meant to tell you who Jesus is. That's not my invention. That's, that's in Mark, right? There's a message in the loaves that they didn't get. In verse 52, it says they didn't get it. The incident with the loaves, they didn't understand. Their hearts were hardened. And it wasn't a message like, like a nice application, cute, tied up in a bow, three-point sermon message. It was meant to communicate, reveal something about who Jesus is so that when they saw him walk on water, they shouldn't have been shocked. They should have been like, of course he can do that because we know who he is. But because they didn't get the, the message of the loaves, they freak out when they see him walking on the water. They're like, what's going on? Um, <clears throat> so it's about who Jesus is. The, the loaves themselves are about who Jesus is. That's a theme in Mark. And we went over that last week, how that communicates Christ. Um, the who is Jesus thing, though, is so consistent. The stories that you, that you hear in Mark are all about who Jesus is. This is what I want to get nailed across in, in this uh, series on the Gospel of Mark in everybody's minds, if possible. When, um, when you're in Mark chapter 1, Jesus is the one who comes to his temple in fulfillment of the promise that who would come to the temple? Yahweh. 
Mark chapter 1, already chapter 1, we're getting Jesus as Yahweh coming to his temple. In Mark chapter 2, Jesus forgives sins, and in a sort of interesting kind of commentary on this, Mark 2, 7, they say, who can forgive sins but God alone? <laughs> it's like pennies in the air, you know? And Mark's just waiting for the penny to drop on you finally when you see who Jesus is. In Mark 2, 27, we get that Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. And I mean, come on. To a Jewish mind, to say, I'm the boss of the Sabbath, who does this make you? Who do you think this is? In the Gospel of Mark, throughout the Gospel, Jesus defeats and rebukes Satan and just, just totally kicks his butt all over the Gospel of Mark effectively, right? Even Michael the Archangel won't rebuke Satan. He appeals to the one who has the authority to rebuke Satan, which is who? Yahweh. And here's Jesus doing this. Jesus even goes a step further, and he has the ability to give other people authority to have power over demons and illness, and he does that in chapter 6 earlier on. He's also the one who commands the wind and sea and the waves, and they obey him. That's in Mark 4.41. He commands them just as throughout the Old Testament, only God can do that. Only God has the power to do that, and here's Jesus doing that. And they even are asking, like, who is this that even the wind and waves obey him? That's the penny in the air. Mark keeps putting it in the air for you. Then he's the one who gives them bread like God did in the Old Testament. But John makes it, that's in chapter 6, but John makes it even more clear because he's not only the one giving the bread, but he's also the bread. And, he, and John, he focuses on the idea that Jesus is the bread from heaven. So he's not from the earth. He came to earth from heaven, which is because he's eternal. And we're only in chapter 6 of Mark. We haven't gotten that far, but we have these constant affirmations of this really high Christology, put it that way. <clears throat> but the way you hear some scholars talk about it, um, and others don't, some of them do, some of them don't, some of them are smart, and some of them are, well, they're all smart, actually, I should say, they are genuinely smart, they're just, you can be smart and stupid at the same time, right? Y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, sometimes they just miss it. Um, now, let's talk about this walking on water, and we'll connect it to the Old Testament, because we've seen in Mark, Jesus is constantly connected to the Old Testament. We're getting an interpretation of Christ as we look at the Old Testament. And in Job 9.8, we have a passage that connects to Jesus walking on water. In Job 9.8, it says that God alone stretches out the heavens and tramples down the waves of the sea. Now, that word is walks on. It's translated tramples down or he's like stomping on the waves of the sea. He's able to walk on the water. Job 9.8. Now, in Job 38.16, Job returns to this, this topic, but it's God speaking now. And God himself, he strengthens this and says to Job, have you entered into the springs of the sea or walked on the recesses of the deep. And it's like, oh, God, you walk and you can't. This is significant. But wait, there's more. In that passage, Job 9, 8, that I read to you, it's uh, peripaton epithalases. That's Greek. I just, that's the Greek, right? The reason why that's important for you to know is this. In Mark 6, 48, that's the exact phrase of Jesus was walking on the sea. Peripaton epithalases. Same phrase in the Greek version of Job that they had access to at the time and in Mark 6, 48. <clears throat> also, we have this curious, even a little confusing idea that Jesus was going to pass by them. And you're like, why is this in Mark? Why, is it, why, is he gonna, why doesn't he just walk to the boat? Why is he going to pass by them? What's the deal here? But in the same section of Job, 9, 8 talks about how God can walk on the sea. 9, 11, Job says this, two verses later. Were he to pass by me, were God to pass by me, I would not see him. Were he to move past me, I would not perceive him. Job's agonizing over the distance between him and God. Jesus, he's the one who walks on the water and guess what? You see him, right? Because you didn't have that access to God and then Christ came. Now you see me. Now you have access to me. He's confirming his identity and his accessibility in this very passage. Um, in fact, in the Old Testament, when God passes by people like in Exodus, when he passes by Moses, all his goodness will pass by you. Um, or in other places as well, God is revealing himself to people, but at some distance. When, uh, when he's dealing with Elijah, and there's the storm, and there's the fire, and there's the wind, there's all this stuff. And then it says, and then God passed by him. There's some nearness, but some distance as well. But with Jesus, he goes to pass by them, but then he gets in the boat. Do you get the idea? Jesus is bringing us into relationship with God. He's God with us. He walks the sea and he comes into the boat with us. But there's more. 
<laughs> there's more too that connects us to the Old Testament. This is what gets me so excited. In Mark 6.50, Jesus tells them why they can calm down. He's like, don't be worried. It is I. It is I. In the Greek, this is the phrase. You already know it. Ego, a me. You know this in the Gospel of John. There's these I am statements of Jesus that connect to not only Exodus, but important that you know this, it connects to Isaiah. When God's declaring himself as the only God, he keeps calling himself the I am in the book of Isaiah, the ego a me. Jesus, he says, don't be afraid, it is I. In Edward James, in his commentary on the Gospel of Mark, he says this about Jesus saying, it is I. It is a divine epiphany in answer to their earlier bafflement when he calmed the storm. Who is this? In Mark 4.41. In this respect, Mark's Christology is no less sublime than, than John's is. Although John has Jesus declaring that he's son of God, John 10.36, whereas Mark has him showing that he is the son of God. In Mark, one must, like the disciples, be in the boat with Jesus and enter into the drama in order to behold who Jesus is. The one who calmed the storm is the one who now appears in the storm, the I am of God. And I think that maybe this answers another question that you probably haven't thought of or maybe you thought of. Why, isn't, why doesn't Mark talk about Peter walking on the water? We get this in another gospel. We don't get it in the gospel of Mark. Um, Matthew has it. And it may be that Mark just wants to so highlight Jesus and that he's using these stories to tell you who Jesus is so he doesn't want to create any kind of confusion by even including the whole little spot about Peter. There's another lesson in there. We get that in the gospel of Matthew. But Mark is telling us who Christ is. So he's seen as walking on the water. But Mark 6.52, their heart was hardened. Their heart was hardened. Now whose heart is being talked about here? The disciples. Their hearts were hardened. That's interesting, huh? We tend to think of hard, hard hearts as being those who are like willfully sinning against God, knowingly sinning against God or something like that. But here, hard hearts don't, doesn't mean outwardly and obviously resisting God. Sometimes it just means you don't get it. Like, I'm just, I'm a dummy. I'm just not picking up these spiritual things that I'm supposed to be learning, you know? And that, that is like a hardness of my heart. Yeah, there's something wrong with me. I get it. It's not on purpose. It's just, you know, it's the way I am. Well, blindness then, I would say, is not the same as closing your eyes, right? Closing your eyes is deliberate, but blindness is a condition I've got. Now, maybe I caused it through some actions of my past, but it's just the way I am now and I'm struggling with it. If this is you, if, if you read the gospel of Mark, if you're reading the word of God and, and you feel like you're, you're just not picking up, the penny won't drop for you. My encouragement would be ask God to open your eyes. If you're like the disciples going, I read about Jesus, I just, it's just, I'm just not getting it. I'm not seeing it. Start praying, sincerely praying between you and the Lord that God would open your eyes. Because you know, my heart might be hard, but if I can ask God to help me with my hard heart, I think he does. I think he does. Well, I, I have my own experience that says he does in my own life uh, many times, <clears throat> many times. And now, of course, my heart is perfect and pure in every way. Yeah, not really. So, um, yeah, the truth of Christ is a lot to take in. And seeing Jesus for who he is, as Mark keeps trying to show us who Christ is, it changes everything about your life. It changes your expectations. Like you wouldn't be surprised to see him walking on the water. You wouldn't be surprised to see the second coming of Christ. You wouldn't be surprised upon closing your eyes on earth to open them in the presence of God. It wouldn't surprise you because you know who he is. And that's the thing is bringing us to that place where we have this sort of rational, reasonable, simple trust in God where this faith is there that's right and that's been earned by truth. Um, and it changes everything about how we see everything. And that is how it's supposed to be as Christians. We're not just a little bit different than the rest of the world. We, we, we have a whole different worldview because of Christ. Verse 53, it says, When they crossed over, they came to, the, to land at Gennesaret and moored to the shore. When they got out of the boat, immediately the people recognized him. Which is interesting because this is the first time in Mark where a big crowd of people recognizes Jesus. Last time they recognized the disciples. And that was after they'd gone out two by two in all the cities, so their faces were being more known. Now they're recognizing Jesus. I think that we're continuing to see the increased awareness of Christ. They recognize him. They run about the whole country and began to carry here and there on their pallets those who were sick to the place they heard he was. By the way, let me just mention, um, they're recognizing Jesus and you're like, well, why now? Jesus just did the, the feeding of the 5,000. You know, it, it's like 
he not only did some healings here and then he went traveling around Galilee, Nazareth area, but now he's done this one really big, massive, huge public healing, not healing, but a miracle where you didn't just hear about that guy down the street that got healed, but like you got to eat a meal and you got to watch it multiply. You know, this is, this was something that seemed to really launch his um, face recognition up into the next level. Then in verse uh, 56, wherever he entered villages or cities or countryside, they were laying the sick in the marketplaces and imploring him that they might just touch the fringe of his cloak. As many as touched it were being cured. And I think we see Jesus here as the one who's going to undo what happened in the Garden of Eden, right? He's, he's bringing health. He's bringing healing. He's bringing forgiveness. He's, he's giving us a, this is, this is like when you're walking through the mall and you walk through, past the Chinese food place and they hold up that glowing piece of chicken on a toothpick and they're like, sample? <laughs> you know, when you get some orange chicken or whatever it is, and you try it out, Jesus is like, hey, here's a sample of the kingdom of God that I'm bringing into the world. Forgiveness, healing, God's provision for you. Now, it's not the ultimate, you know, his kingdom is not of this world, and we're ultimately waiting upon the restoration that comes, but we're getting the sample of it through the ministry of Christ. So there's the fruit of coming to faith in him. That's the point. Uh, our, our job is the faith. The healings are just an illustration, I think, ultimately. We, we sometimes get the idea that the healings are the whole, the whole thing of Jesus rather than the healings are like a, like a proof. Here, see, this food tastes good. See, taste it. Yeah, see, it, it, it proves that this is good stuff. With Jesus, we get this in the Gospel of Mark, too, when he heals the paralytic. It couldn't be more clear, right? He's going to heal the paralytic, right? They lower him through the roof, and he looks at the man, and he says to him, not be healed. He says, son, your sins are forgiven you. And they're irked. They're like, what, who do you think you are? You have the authority to forgive sins. Only God can forgive sins. And Jesus says, okay, so that you'll know I have the authority to forgive sins. Get up and walk. And the guy gets up and walks. What was the purpose of the healing? Well, the primary purpose was to show that Jesus has authority to forgive sins. We're revealing something about Christ through the healings that we see. The idea here is that we and this is throughout Mark, right? We can look to Jesus as the one we trust. The one we trust for everything. In the trials, for healing, for when healing doesn't come. You trust him for uh, forgiveness of your sins. And that is, of course, the primary thing that I need. So, let's pray. Then we'll go to your guys' thoughts. Uh, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for this passage. The Jesus, that vision of you walking on the water. Um, help us to see it. This is... Uh, a revelation of the person of Christ. He's God with us and God coming near to us and God entering into the boat with us. Jesus, you made us close to you. We thank you for your grace and for the forgiveness of our sins purchased on the cross. We pray that as we continue going through the gospel of Mark, we would have the penny drop for us. We'd have our eyes opened, that we would see the glory of Christ, see the truth of Christ, and that we could apply this into our lives, both in trusting you for your forgiveness, but also trusting in trials and also trusting you even um, for your work of healing in our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.